Welcome to the Movie Goer Society podcast brought to you by Neurotropolis. I'm your host, Sean Toshford, the mayor of Neurotropolis. And joining me once again is my co-host, Drew Munhausen, a professional media and movie mastermind who has found a new symbiote friend. Uh, what's that fellow's name behind you? That's that's Venom, but we we are Venom, you know. Uh, I'm going to question your, you know, um, maybe you have to go to a psych ward if you're saying we we and things. We are Venom. Um, I would use a different symbiote name, but I'm not going to lie. I'm not the most well-versed in all the symbiote lore of the Venom franchise of like, cause there's so many different ones and I could have probably pulled out some like deep cut symbiote name, but I, I just don't, I just don't know them. That's okay. You don't need multiple personalities on this podcast. We don't, need, we, don't need, <laughs> <laughs> we don't need that. But yes, in this podcast, we explore the world of cinema from beloved classics. So latest blockbusters. And we're on episode 58, where we're going to witness the last dance with Eddie Brock and Venom. Uh, super exciting stuff there. We have a lot to get into. But before we do that, we want to make sure you can connect with us online because we're first trying to connect with all of you. We want to build our you know, followers. We want to see what y'all are doing. Tag us, share stuff with us. You can find me on almost every single social media platform at Sean Taj. Follow Nertropolis at Nertropolis. And please don't forget to visit Nertropolis.com for your daily dose of movie news, reviews, interviews, and trailers. And Drew, where can they find you when you're not contributing to Nertropolis? Yeah, you can find me at Drew Munhausen on all the different social media platforms. You can find me weekly at Fresh Out the Podcast, where we talk about all kinds of stuff. But most of all, you can find me here, Moviegoer Society, talking movies, giving hot takes, you know, all the fun stuff. It's all about those hot takes um, these days. But also don't forget to catch up on all those past episodes of the Moviegoer Society. Uh, tune into my podcast, Real Insights, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and of course, the Nertropolis YouTube channel. Uh, I'm trying to see what I've have. I mean, I'm actually backlogged a little bit, so I'm going to have some great stuff for you. Um, outside of that, I do have a interview with Todd McFarlane, exclusive one on one, which is really great. Um, I also have um, not a video interview, but a discussion with Mr. John Voigt himself and also the uh, owner of Atlas Comics and Mesco Toys, um, Marty Abrams. So that was a little fun little impromptu interview <laughs> that we did just reminiscing about comics which was really great um but i have a lot to say before we jump into venom but first off i came home to a great little thing um drew twisters is now available twisters is now available uh this is the 4k ultra hd so you can see uh glenn powell and all his glory in the most high def ever and um that's that texas charm is just gonna win you over um you're willing to watch twisters again i would good movie it is and um you went to oklahoma for school so did you have any twisters over there no, there definitely were times where like the tornado sirens were going off and they were close by i was absolutely horrified of just tornado scenarios in general but when you're around a bunch of people that have been born and raised in Oklahoma and they are used to it, they don't freak out at all. They were like, let's go out to the to the balcony and let's go watch. And I was like, no, thank you. That is not my style. Uh, half my friends that live up there have um, tornado shelters, you know, in their garages or back patios. It's like the big metal slat you slide open and there's stairs that go down and a bench or something. So, I mean, that that is common practice there. And for me, not something I don't think I could ever get used to. I guess it's their form of entertainment as well. Uh, it's the Wild West over there when it comes to twisters. But we have you here. You didn't get eaten up by a twister. Um, so we can it's, continue our it, podcast. <laughs> it's worth noting that uh, a bunch of my really close friends that I go visit each year live in a small town in Oklahoma called El Reno, Oklahoma. And El Reno is actually the site of the big kind of finale climax of twisters um you actually see the el reno water tower like crash down into buildings they seek shelter in the old historic el reno movie theater and they actually shut down the main street uh, of the town when they filmed the movie there and so that's like all my friends that live there that's their new claim to fame is that twisters was shot in uh, el reno oklahoma and their t little town part of it was shut down for a while when they were filming it there on location so it's called El Reno. El Reno. 
All right. So Universal, for the folks at El Reno, for all 10 people in El Reno, please deliver them a copy of <laughs> Twisters. They uh, have more than 10 people. It's okay, 15 like people. Come on. 15 yeah. people in El Reno. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that is now available on 4K Ultra HD. So thank you very much for that. Um, to relive Twisters, I still love the first one much, much more. But we won't get into that. Um, some show and tell time. A couple things. Uh, tomorrow, this is going up today. So tomorrow I'll actually be jumping on great day, Houston, kind of recap some of the exciting stuff I've been doing and some local events happening as well. And I also leave for space con, um, hosting a bunch of panels. I'm hosting Ewan McGregor's panel. Super excited. I'm doing star Trek next gen, um, star Trek Voyager panel, Stargate. Um, I'm also doing Ming-Na Wen's panel and, uh, Gina Carino's panel. And then, um, Jim Starlin. Um, his fame to uh, Thanos and the Infinity Gauntlet and all that stuff. And I think that is it. But I, you know, I couldn't tell you. I think that's all the panels I'm doing. But if you're in San Antonio, Texas, come say hello to me. Join me at my panels. I'm super excited for this great opportunity. Go back and um, we're going to have a lot of fun. It's been an exciting couple weeks or so. I mean, I went to New York Comic Con. Uh, it was so much to do. Got to meet Todd McFarlane again, talk to him. So that interview is up. Also, uh, if you can see, I finally got my, um, oh, that thumb went in great. That thumb placement. So wrong. <laughs> so wrong. <laughs> that thumb... Uh, my Wolverine bucket that you could have ordered from AMC a while ago finally got delivered. So I got that. And then I got this new product from Thrill Joy which is the ex Funko CEO, Brian Mariotti's new company. You can see how big their boxes are. It's crazy. It's like a television set, a frame. Um, we hooked, he hooked us up with a bunch of stuff at the Thrill Joy party. That's Beetlejuice back there. But you can see the size of the Thrill Joy products. The thing that runs you 50 bucks, but I mean, it's a massive thing. Um, really cool. Um, so that's like the newest in collectibles per se. Uh, ran into John Voigt. Our good friend, John Voigt at New York Comic Con. I got an email that he was making an appearance. I was like, I got to see him in person. I had two great interviews with them. Um, got to catch up with them. And so there's a little interview on there. And then did you see that lovely note he he gave my mom? I did. It was really sweet. It was sweet, but I love it. Must congratulate the mother. <laughs> Your son is a fine man. Uh, so definitely he is a charming man. I got to go to the Blumfest panel. So, I mean, there's a lot that we're showing. I'm trying to recap in my head, but you know, um, it's been a couple busy. I saw the trailer for a new trailer, a new trailer for Wolfman before it went live. And I was um, hesitant about Wolfman, but now I'm kind of all in. Uh, it looks great. I went to the SpongeBob 25th anniversary panel, which was really fun. They did some, uh, the whole cast was there. Even um, Tom Clancy was there. Obviously, he was there for the Penguin and for SpongeBob, and he plays Mr. Krabs. But they did some. Um, oh, you mean um, is it Tom Clancy, Cl Clancy Brown. Brown? Why say Tom Clancy? I get the I, in my head every time I see Clancy Brown, I say Tom Clancy in my head. You, but that's, you went with you that's know a splinter cell. Could, that's, be, could that be called the the more popular Clancy or the more well known Clancy? <laughs> no, maybe? no, not the well known. <laughs> No, I find myself over the years always saying Tom Clancy or Clancy Brown for whatever reason, because those are not very common names to say. But yes, Clancy Brown, who's great in The Penguin um, and great as Mr. Krabs. I mean, come on. Like, um, it's fantastic to see him there. And they did some um, reading. I love Clancy Brown. He's one, one of the great that guy character actors. Oh, he's he's fantastic. Um, so really Shawshank. Good. I still think of him in Shawshank. They made some jokes Often. about that stuff during the panel. Um, but we need Clancy Brown to be something in a Tom Clancy <laughs> adaptation. <or something. laughs> uh, that'd be full circle for me. Um, and then the Sony panel, which kicked off and it wasn't released. Drew, did you see a trailer for Karate Kid Legends? No, I did not. I don't think anyone did, but we did. And oh boy, uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I post a lot of reactions. I, I post mostly a lot of live, you know, in the moment stuff on Twitter. That's probably the best place to um, keep up and get some really cool insights and exclusive stuff too. Or first time to hear about things. Karate Kid Legends, you know, the karate, it's merging the Jackie Chan movie with Cobra Kai and the Karate Kid with Ralph Macchio, all that stuff. And, you know, people weren't a big fan of the Jackie Chan movie. Um, but I liked it all in 
I actually liked that movie too. I was working at a movie theater when that came out. I had just started working there and I remember going to a free, like I, I used my employee credentials to get into the karate kid uh, with Jackie Chan and uh, Jaden Smith. And I liked it. I liked it too, especially at the time we didn't have karate kid. We didn't have Cobra Kai. We didn't have anything. Um, I am. I'm not a karate kid person either. Like I don't watch Cobra Kai. I don't have much nostalgia for the old karate kid movies. So don't you know. say this drew because the Bye. Cobra Kai part two of the final season trailer just dropped as we're doing this. Uh, I'm a big karate kid fan. I watched all of them multiple times. Even the Hillary Swank one. Um, love them. But this movie is merging somehow the two worlds. Ben Wang is taking the lead as the young protege. And I'll just have to say this. The trailer was nuts, intense, great action, tons of emotion. But like I said, great fighting. I think Cobra Kai has helped elevate the fighting that they're showcasing. But I think this takes it to a whole nother level because you have Jackie Chan involved. And he's all about showcasing the best of the best. Um, Ralph Macchio is in it. Ming-Na Wen's actually in it. I'm not sure what her role is going to be. But um, we realize that Jackie Chan's character knows Mr. Miyagi. So that's like the big thing. But the trailer looked amazing. I was all in. I was like, wow, this looks so cool, especially coming from Cobra Kai, which is a TV show, to see something cinematic, but still have kind of the same flair. So after that panel, we got treated to more Sony stuff. Um, Aaron Taylor Johnson joined us for Craven the Hunter uh, with a bunch of people dressed up as Craven, which is awesome. Are you a big fan of this uh, Spider-Man villain, uh, probably one of the most unheard of, but still iconic to me. Not people are familiar with him unless they grew up with the comics or even the animated show. I do like Craven now. I remember when I first, when I was younger and was re reading comics and kind of first heard about Craven, I was like, he's just a guy who hunts and he wants to hunt Spider-Man. Like, I don't, I don't get it, but if you really d dive into the character and some of the really good Craven storylines and, and lore, I think Craven's really interesting character. Actually, he's very well used in the new uh, PlayStation five, you know, Spider-Man two game. Craven's a big part of that. And I, I, I like interesting and unique takes on Craven. I still think that the, Sony choice to make a Craven movie is interesting, but I mean, I'm not surprised the same studio that did Morbius and Madam Web, like, of course, they're doing this. That being said, some of the trailers that they've released have actually got me at least interested. And I'm not going into this in the same way that I went into Madam Web or, or Morbius. So I'm uh, extremely cautiously optimistic. <laughs> well, first off, it's radar. I'm going to put that out there, which is the first time they're doing this for a Spider-Man type film. Second. We were treated to a op the opening scenes or scene, very long scene of Craven the Hunter opens up in a very cold, full of snow, Russia, where he is going into prison. And it's Russian, like throughout the like, good chunk of it. Like it's all Russian, which is awesome. So very like they stick to like what Craven is in his world and stuff like that. And then when it gets to the action and just the Aaron Taylor Johnson's just charisma as Craven is amazing because he does. Craven the Hunter has confidence and charisma for many reasons. Um, but I'll tell you this. We learn quickly why it's rated R. Holy smokes. Blood, action, just brutal. Craven's brutal. And then we got treated to another scene, which was a little bit more brutal than that and how he's like kind of taking out his, you know, um, his enemies. Uh, it's questionable, like who's good or bad. I couldn't tell what was going on and what the situation is because we didn't get to watch obviously the whole movie, but it earned as rated R. And to be honest, it's a quali really quality film. It seems like a lot more love went into this. And uh, I mean, you got Aaron Taylor Johnson. I mean, I, there's no, and you got Russell Crowe. There's no reason this should really tank. And I'm really like knocking on wood that it doesn't. And they do see some success with this because what I saw actually looks fantastic. And I can see why a Craven the Hunter origin movie or whatever you want to do works before he meets Spider-Man or doesn't meet Spider-Man. Just in general, his story was always like an isolated story. You really Spider-Man's not really involved in Craven the Hunter's story and his origin. So that's what's so beautiful uh, about this. So super excited for that. And then um, we got treated to a Venom panel with Tom Hardy and the rest of the cast there. And they showed us some great clips 
of Venom. And we're going to talk about that because I didn't get a chance to see the, the movie. Um, you got to see clips before I did, but I got to see the movie before you did. <laughs> oh, but I will say this. I got to meet Tom Hardy and get my picture with Tom Hardy. And he signed a couple of things. So I have that to brag about. Um, I do want to brag about Tom Hardy. Incredible human. What a gentleman. After the panel was done, you know, I was right by the stage. A bunch of people came up to the stage and he was signing things and so forth. And then the crowd got a little bit bigger um, and a little crazy. People were super excited. Um, he held he held it together. Stuck a, stood like st stuck around for maybe 35 minutes or so as there's a big group of people uh, signing things, taking selfies and like being really cool and chill about it where he really shouldn't. And some of the security was like unsure if this was okay. He just stayed into himself and was so pleasant with everybody. And literally after a while, they just decided, Hey, let's just make a line and go through it faster because this is kind of a little hectic and it worked out, but he was so great. Um, what a great human. He's a big star. He didn't have to stick around. I've been to a lot of the panels at New York Comic Con. No one did what he did, and no one has the star power that he has um, to stick around and really put up with the fans and the crowd. Um, so kudos to Tom Hardy. He is actually a great actor, but a, a greater human being. And um, I'll just cherish that. I even told him, I was like, Tom Hardy, I was like, you're a gentleman, man. This is really cool that you're doing this for everybody. And um, yeah, it's just awesome. He's great in everything, but when you meet him personally, like this guy is cool. Do you want to grab a beer with him? That's for sure. <laughs> um, so that's my like New York Comic Con spiel. But then I came home for like maybe 48 hours. And then Drew, where did I have to go? San Francisco. The good folks at Netflix uh, flew me out to San Francisco to um, do a lot of stuff for Ultraman Rising. A great film. A film that not many people maybe not know about. But Ultraman is back in a great, great film on Netflix. It's been streaming for a while. Got to speak to directors and the cast previously. I even ran into Ultraman himself at New York Comic Con, Christopher Sean. He is like Ken Sato in this in, in real life. Uh, we went to Skywalker Ranch. Yes, Skywalker Ranch. We saw George Lucas's house and then right across is where the big theater is, where they do a lot of stuff with the Atmos. And we had a great dinner and then a great um, Q&A and just a bunch of stuff and diving deep into Ultraman Rising. Uh and if you go on my Instagram or Twitter, I have all that stuff posted, even my Facebook. But then the next day we got to go to ILM, which was nuts. Uh, I'm slowly posting my ILM stuff, but we did more in-depth stuff for Ultraman Rising. Find out like it was 23 years in the making this movie. That's how crazy that is. A lot of love and care. Great messaging. It's all about, you know, family and balance and being the hero and really being uh, not being selfish. And um, did more interviews, did a full tour of the place. I mean, this was mind blowing. A lot of Star Wars stuff, a lot of other stuff as well, which I'll be sharing. And I got to have one on one interviews with the VFX um, sound composer and the directors again. I mean, full circle, I guess. Um, and I got to get, you know, this really cool thing. This figure arts figure of Ultraman himself at Emmy, who is the baby kaiju in this film. Um, Drew, how, did you get a chance to see Ultraman Rising yet? Or it's I did not. I've seen. Uh, I did see. This is not. I mean, it's Ultraman related, but at Fantastic Fest last year, I saw Shin Ultraman, which I really enjoyed because I'm not like a big Ultraman guy. Like I just never had much exposure to Ultraman, and I found that movie to be really good. That's like the live action kind of modernization Shin Ultraman. It's really good. I recommend that. But I have not watched um, Ultraman Rising yet. Well, the perfect thing about Ultraman Rising, it's a family film. And I think um, your oldest girl will actually love it and really catch on to it, especially with Emmy, um, the baby Kaiju, who was brought to life by the man who actually created Grogu, is the one behind Emmy and bringing Emmy to life. Um, so there's a lot to like about this. And it's actually a pretty long film. Like it's a full feature film, really great. Um, there's just so much to love about it. Uh, so stay tuned for all that more Ultraman stuff coming. But Ultraman Rising, the film that really needs the most attention right now. We forget about it because it's on Netflix. We have great animated films. I know people love the wild robot and stuff like that. But I think we need to revisit Ultraman Rising and really showcase what Netflix and ILM are doing together to bring something like this. Like I said, it was 23 years in the making. Tons of love by the directors. Uh, Shannon Tindo, who created the story and everything and, and John, the co-director, like they took a lot of their own lives and lives from other people to create this really relatable story at the same time. 
Uh, so that was, you know, now I'm back and now I have to go again, the next day, <laughs> the space gone. So that's kind of, uh, my journey for October, which was super exciting, but yeah, I didn't make it to venom last night. Um, so now it's time for drew to take the microphone away from me <laughs> and, uh, tell us all about venom. Let's dive deep into venom. The last dance. Well, you know, it's interesting you talking about Tom Hardy and, and everything. I'm looking at his filmography and I didn't realize how kind of little he's done since starting up Venom. Like he's really been invested in the Venom world because, you know, before Venom is when he did Dunkirk and he had a really busy 2015. But really after 2018's Venom, he did the Al Capone movie that came out right when COVID started that like barely got released and nobody saw it. Um but Venom, then Venom, let there be carnage. And then the, you know, post credit scene in Spider-Man No Way Home, an uncredited role in, in the Matrix Resurrections. And then he had the bike riders and now another Venom movie. So like he's made three Venom movies in the span of six years and really only one other like big role. And I'll tell movie. you why, though. He also is like a producer and helps with a story and helps write as well. So he's also not just starring in these. He's actually trying to put them out and put them together. Uh, yeah, he and and. uh Kelly Marcel, who ha, who directed this one. So Kelly Marcel has been uh, a producer and, and writer on the on all of them. I think she might not have been a writer on the first one, but has been a producer at least. But she and Tom Hardy came up with the story for this one and Let There Be Carnage. And she did the screenplay for both. And then this is her directorial debut. So, yeah, there's people that have been involved with this franchise from the beginning, seeing it through. And and obviously, Tom Hardy is very, very involved from a creative standpoint, which I get it. This is a platform for him to be extremely goofy. And I think he has a lot of fun doing that. Um, Sean, where are you at on the previous two venom entries just curious the first one is fun it was a great way to show us how venom can exist without spider-man i was all in cool and i was like maybe he'll meet spider-man down the line i mean that'll be a smart way to do figure it out Two, love carnage at the character um i grew up with the maxim carnage video game which was really cool because you also saw other symbiotes in that as well um but and i love the casting i thought it was perfect but man, that would have been a great radar film. And uh, Let There Be Carnage would have been a great radar film instead of Craven the Hunter being the first one. And they just did Carnage a little too dirty. I kind of wanted to see more Carnage from Carnage. I think there wasn't enough. He is a he's a serial killer. Like he is a brutal person. And I wish we just saw more back and forth between the two. I think the movie was rushed. I liked a lot about it, but like it really just left a bad taste in my mouth. And I'm not saying it's a horrible movie. As a Carnage fan, it wasn't the best way I would have gone about it, but I'm thankful we got a carnage and he looked cool and the battle was cool in the church, but man, as I see what they're doing in the future, I was like, man, if they showed the same type of love and attention that they're doing for what they're doing now back then, it, I think it would have been better. And uh, maybe that sequel was rushed. Well, how, maybe who knows? Um, but now we have a third one. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of with you. I'm the first venom I thought was like, kind of like junk food. Like I didn't think it was necessarily very good, but I enjoyed it, you know, for what it was. And then Venom, let there be carnage. I was actually more excited for, because I like carnage and I'm with you. Like, I just thought it was a little bit disappointing. So I have enjoyed the Venom movies for what they are. Even if I don't think that they're necessarily very good, I still think they're fun. And I like the Tom Hardy performance at the center of them. And uh, and so I was interested to see what they were going to do going into Venom, the last dance for two reasons, a because it's the third Venom movie. And, you know, they're really they've really been marketing this as, you know, its title is the last dance there. The poster itself says witness the epic conclusion. They are marketing this as the end of at least this Venom trilogy. It, will it be the end of Venom as a character in a franchise and movies? No, I doubt it, especially if this movie makes decent money like the past two entries have done. So I, I don't I think we have to worry about that. But um, I was interested. I was also interested just to say, you know, between me and you, they did the post credit scene in Venom. Let there be carnage where Eddie Brock ends up in the MCU, you know, seeing Peter Parker is Spider-Man. We get a little bit more of that in No Way Home and he goes back to his home and the beginning of this movie kind of references that, but that's it. 
like, you know, I, I was really interested to see if they were going to do any kind of more MCU ties. And I won't I won't go in depth because I, obviously I don't want to spoil, but I just want to manage expectations for those going into it. Like this is a Venom movie. This is a Venom symbiote movie. Um, and it, we've seen in the trailers that they're they're introducing Noel here. And essentially the the plot is because of the stuff going on from the last Venom movie, Eddie Brock and Venom are, are on the run together and they're being chased by both the U.S. military and by essentially these like big bug like alien creatures that are minions of Noel that are specifically after Venom because of something, something caused by the the bond between Eddie and Venom they need in order to basically rescue or unlock Noel. Okay. That's that's the the general plot here. The problem is it, it, one of the things about this movie that I thought kind of handcuffed that I didn't like is that Venom is only detectable by these monsters when he's in full venom form when it is eddie brock wearing the symbiote as venom so because of that they have to limit when he can be venom which i thought was a really strange way to to handcuff your third venom movie when like we've had two previous movies we should be getting a lot more of venom i wanted more of like venom as the lethal protector and instead it's like venom on the run limiting how much he can actually be venom that being said it means that Eddie Brock is really on display here a lot. And Tom Hardy's just so good in these movies because he's so strange. His physical performance is so good when he does these like jerky movements because he's being controlled by Venom kind of behind the scenes. Like, I love all of that stuff. And I love their banter and the way they talk to each other. And all of that makes me laugh. So it's kind of amazing that even in some of the ways I thought this movie stumbled from a plot standpoint, that is still able to be kind of successful just because of the Tom Hardy and Venom banter in it. That's what really makes these movies work is Tom Hardy, to be honest. I don't see, I mean, that's weird though, because like I didn't see him as Eddie Brock when he was cast. I was like, that's kind of weird. Uh, they created something and they just relied on his star power, his charisma and his abilities and it works. And that's what I really like to see future movies in general go for are these risks just because they know they have the talent there and just um no people are gonna be open to a very likable actor and, and a very talented one as well you mentioned noel any discussions in this movie about multiverse anything um because i know the symbiote i think that was mentioned before in the previous venom movies about how their mind works the hive thing and all this stuff and it goes up beyond the multiverse but we don't really have much when it comes to multiverse talking in this film at all no, not really. I mean, the closest thing is at the beginning when uh, Eddie Brock is he's the movie basically kicks off right where those past end credit scenes um, ended, where he's like in the, the bar in Mexico talking to uh, the actor that plays. I think of him as Danny Rojas from Ted Lasso. That's who the actor is. And. He, you know, he makes a reference to like to Thanos, like, oh, this Thanos thing happened, you know, that kind of, and then that's it. And then it's like back to this normal Sony cinematic Spider-Man universe. And that's it. There's no other mention of like hive mind there. There is a lot of symbiote stuff in this movie that kind of makes up at least a little bit for the lack of actual venom. I mean, there's not a lack of venom that you still get a decent amount of venom, but like it just felt like there could have been more. And no one mentions why Mordo is in here. <laughs> That's just. I mentioned I mentioned this in my review, the which will be live on Nerdtropolis, I assume, by the time that this episode of uh, Movie Goer Society is up. This because Eddie Brock's on the run in this movie, a lot of the supporting cast from the previous movies like Michelle Williams and so on, like they're not in this movie at all. So it introduces some new characters. You mentioned Shibatel Ejiofor, who who has played Baron Mordo in the MCU. He's here as just like generic, mean U.S. military soldier man. And um, you get uh, Juno Temple, also from Ted Lasso fame, as a doctor here who they try to give like a backstory to. And I just didn't find anything about her to be interesting. And uh Risa Fons is also in this movie. Yeah, so who, what's up with that? I was going to say, like, the lizard is in this? I, and 
And I assumed because of the Sony Spider-Man movies of Pat, like the amazing Spider-Man movies. When I saw he was in this, I thought he was going to be Kurt Connors and he's not, he's a totally different character. He's just a guy who's like a hippie on vacation with his family. They're trying to get into alien to area 51 to, to see some aliens themselves. He's great. I love Reese Fonz. He's just always super weird. Um, you know, shout out to Hassel the Dragon, who I think he's one of the most interesting characters on that show right now, too. Um, but yeah, like, so I was kind of confused when he showed up and I'm like, oh, he is a completely different character. And I just thought it was a really interesting choice to use Risa Fons, to use Shibotel Ejio for who have played like kind of prominent villainous characters in previous Marvel movies. They are playing entirely new characters here in a movie that has like a kind of a dotted line to the MCU because of these post credit scenes they've done. I just thought it was really interesting to do that. And I mean, but that's it. There's there's no greater connections here. So they are just entirely different characters. So that's that's worth noting for anybody who, you know, just don't want anybody to go in with expectations of like, we're going to see. Tom Holland show up in this movie and Venom and you know it, no, no this is a Venom movie. I also see like the the casting. There's someone that plays a character named Echo. Did you pick up on that? It's a girl that plays a character named Echo, which is interesting. Uh, no, maybe when I get watch, I'll take a look. It says someone plays Echo. I'm like, that's kind of weird uh, that they would use a character that same name. Um, I'm looking at the list here too. I don't even know who Hala, that would be. Hala Finley. But um, is it obvious who plays Noel in this? No, I didn't know until I was looking at this cast list now. I, I mean, I, I don't know how much you want me to say. I, I've, I feel I, like we I've know already... who Noel, we know who Noel is, who like, is the, direct, like the, the director of Let There Be Carnage. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I'm just I feel like I'm already walking a tight line with some spoiler. Like, I'm not spoiling what's in the movie, but I've spoiled some things that are not in the movie. So, you know. No, it's fine. I don't uh, feel like you're in spoiler territory, especially since I haven't seen it. Uh, it's stuff like you see from the trailers and stuff that's been said online and, and, and so forth. Um, but how is Noel in this movie? Do we see a lot of him or is he mysterious? He's like the Thanos figure from like phase one. More mysterious. Yeah, you barely see him. And when you do see him, he's usually head down with his hair down over his face. You don't really see him much at all. You see mainly his like i don't know what to call it, like his minions whatever but they're the big bug like creatures i i referenced which are actually pretty well designed creatures and they're very large and very intimidating and clearly like nobody really stands a chance against them their design is actually really cool too when they they eat people blood like shoots out the back of their heads and it almost looks like a wood chipper but with people <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's pretty that's one of the scenes i saw at the sony panel was that and then there it's like that chase through the water and mm -hmm. where um venom the symbiote it has to like jump around and he's like swimming i thought those like separate shots of venom as the symbiote moving around was pretty cool and swimming around and then jumping from animal to animal uh and so forth was really cool um it looks like big action a lot of great scenes um uh, a lot of cool creature designs at the same time. Um, but like I said, it's um it's like a road trip movie. Is that what yeah, it is? It's it's it is like a road trip movie. It's kind of all over the place. Um, it's trying to do a lot. And when you, when a movie like this tries to do a lot, that means that a lot of things like aren't very successful, or you know, there's just not as much depth there as you want. But again, going back to what I said earlier. A lot of that kind of goes out the window, though, because you're just excited to see Tom Hardy and being weird and talking to Venom and their banter like that makes up for it. Um, so, yeah, so I enjoyed that of it, and I thought that the, the Tom Hardy as Eddie Brock and Venom connection was so established at this point um, that I do think this is probably despite criticisms I have probably this the strongest of the three venom entries so far but in my opinion as i kind of mentioned that i thought the previous two entries were like junk food that weren't good that i enjoyed anyway I, I guess i'm not setting the bar that high but this one's probably the best one even though i don't i still don't think it's like 
an amazing movie, but I had a good time. Like I had a fun time watching it. I, I saw it um, with a pretty packed house and some friends that, that saw it there with me seemed to be higher on it than even I was. So I do think it will please fans of Venom and um, there will people there will be people who will be really happy with this and will defend it. Uh, I on one hand, I like I think it's just good fun, um, but not much more than that, even if it still might be the best of the Venom movies. I've heard a lot of I've heard and seen a lot of great reactions to this film that just had a great time with it and a lot of positive um, stuff about it. And you'll we'll have your review up real soon attached to this as well. Um, the first lady of Nertropolis was also there and she gave it a 10 out of 10. She loved it. Popcorn. Oh, fun, good. Like, yeah, good time. Um, so it seems like everyone's just having a fun time with this. I think it's a film like, you know, with Tom Hardy. And the, we don't get enough films like this. I think um, they're just a just a good time at the theater a good way to check out from whatever's happening in life and whatever, and just enjoy what's in front of you and not have to like think too much about it. And it's thanks to Tom Hardy and, you know, his great performance as Eddie Brock with Venom. Um, when I was at that panel, this is not the end of Noel. Apparently I have not seen the movie, but like Noel, there's bigger plans for Noel and I can see that. And there's rumblings of like, Noel is going to be part of um, Spider-Man four. Um, so that's why they kind of had this idea and um yeah i'm, I'm excited I'm, to see this because i want to see if there's any connections i can find because i i like kind of connecting ways they can jump over to the mcu if they ever do it but noel apparently there's bigger plans and i'm hopefully it's not just a sony plan it's an mcu and sony plan for noel because he's a big deal well we'll see um they there it definitely could be but they definitely also treat this movie like a send off for Eddie Brock and Venom as a combo, which so, is fine because you don't need him in the MCU anymore. Like you don't need him in the MCU at all because there's other symbionts, there's anti Venom, there's other people that become Venom or become with a symbiote, and also we need that. I haven't seen it, and I'm not gonna spoil anything because I don't know anything either. There has to be a way where Noel knows about Spider Man. Somehow Spider-Man gets a hold of a symbiote and we get all that stuff. And there's so much that can happen in the MCU. And I think that's where they're trying to lean towards. Yeah, I, I'm I guess I was kind of surprised, even though they have been marketing this as a finale, at how much of a finale it really seemed to be. That being said, you know, as well as me as with these comic book movies, that any finale is never really a finale. So um I think that there's still ways that they can that they can change it. But if this were the end of the Venom franchise, like it is like a it is a proper ending in a way. It's the and end it, of the Tom treats, Hardy, maybe the Tom Hardy Venom. Right. And it and it treats this ending like as if the audience has a lot of reverence for the Tom Hardy Venom, which I thought was like kind of funny because it's just been it's uh, almost like, you know, at the end of Deadpool and Wolverine, how during the credits they had oh, the like Fox this kind off. of, <laughs> yeah, this like nostalgic Fox stuff. It's nothing, it's not that egregious in this, but they, there's like similar things that I was like, am I supposed to be having an emotional reaction to this? Because I'm not, but uh, maybe some people will. <laughs> I don't know. Well, a lot of young kids, this is their first introduction to Venom because of Tom Hardy, to be honest. Um, yeah. This was really, a lot of people didn't know about Venom. None of them saw cartoons, didn't know the comic books, or even saw Spider Man 3 with Toby. Um, but they said Noel will, will return. I mean, that was from the director's mouth, and um, Noel is around to stick around. Um, lastly, before we go towards the end, Mid credit and credit scene. What is there anything for us to stick around for? Yes, there's a mid credits and an end credit scene. All right. So now I know what to, when I get a chance to watch this, I know I need to stick around. All y'all need to stick around. Uh, Are they worth sticking around for? Always I say no, always drew. The answer is always good or bad. Always. And to stay through the credits. So you can see all the amazing people that did the hard work. There you go. <laughs> uh, thank y'all all for tuning in to another episode of the movie Go society. This was exciting. We didn't get to really talk for a while. Drew, did you ever see smile too? I did. I actually 
I really liked Smile too. Okay, I'm on the other side of that. Maybe we save that for another <laughs> episode. Um, really like the first one more. But please subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Share all our Nerdtropolis content we have coming your way. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter slash X, Instagram. We would love the support. Tag us and things. Share things with us. And uh, once again, Drew, where can they find you? Hey, you can find me at Drew Munhausen on different social media platforms. You can find me here in Movie Ghost Society weekly at Fresh Out the Podcast and over on Letterboxd logging movies like I just logged Venom the Last Dance last night. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of the Movie Ghost Society. Once again, I'm Sean Toshworth, the mayor of Metropolis, and we will see you at the movies.